so good morning. Good morning, good morning. We are in the month of free to be whole. Free to be whole. I love that. We are that, right? We are freedom. We are wholeness. I mean, we're, we're both in one and all of it. You know, I thought about all of those qualities of God, and I thought, you know, we could just put wholeness up there. That would include everything, wouldn't it? I mean, really, when you come down to it. Anyway, we started the month with I am freedom, and then Peter Boland last week spoke to the two faces of God, which are really within us also, you know, as well, because we are that. We are the very nature of spirit, right? Spirit demonstrates through us. All of those qualities demonstrate through us. We don't get them, we don't achieve them, we don't find them, they're not gifted to us. It's just that that is the, in, the inherent nature of us because it is the inherent nature of the divine. The divine has all those qualities, and so since the divine made everything out of itself, we then have all of those qualities. It's just the way it is. You know, spirit has created everything from its own energy, from its own nature, so that everything has all of the qualities that we attribute to spirit. Ernest Holmes said this, he said, the spirit of God is an undivided and indivisible wholeness. It fills all time with its presence and peoples all space with the activity of its thought. So there is nothing else, that's it. There is nothing else. There is simply spirit in form or out of form. Everything in the manifest universe is spirit experiencing itself as all form everywhere. So everything is made out of the same stuff, right? There was nothing else to make anything out of. So whatever qualities we attribute to spirit have to then, by that extension, be qualities of us. So freedom is a quality of spirit. Freedom is a quality of us. It inhabits everything that spirit creates. And we are the very essence of freedom. We are the very essence of freedom. If you think about it, right, free will. They, we talk about this all the time. We're the very essence of freedom, which means we are free to feel bound. <laughs> Love the way we do that to ourselves, right? We are free to feel bound. We are free to think thoughts of lack. We are free to embrace false beliefs and false ideas about ourselves. We are free to feel limited. You, you kind of get that, right? We are free to experience as much or as little of these divine qualities as we can believe and choose and embody and demonstrate. We have been left alone to discover the divinity within ourselves. And we've been left alone because of free will to discover that inner divinity in our own time and in our own way. Ernest Holmes said this, he said, to suppose the creative intelligence of the universe would create man in bondage and leave him bound would be to dishonor the creative power which we call God. To suppose that a God could make a man as an individual without leaving him alone to discover for himself would be to suppose an impossibility. That's free will. We were created in the image and after the likeness of all of this, of this wholeness that is spirit. But we have to discover it ourselves. We can't, that's what total freedom means. Total freedom means exactly that. We are left alone to discover the truth for ourselves about ourselves. We cannot be pre-programmed to know our divine nature because that would not be free will. We'd be robots if we were made to know. We discover our divine nature all along the way, don't we? We're right, all the time. You know that, that ancient Hindu story? I'm sure we're familiar with that story about there once was a time long, long ago, <laughs> there, in a far, 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 there was, there was a time in which all human beings were gods. And they so abused their divinity that Brahman, the chief god, decided to take it away from them and hide it where they could never find it. So where to hide our divinity was the question. And so Brahman brought together a council of gods. And he asked them, where shall we hide humans' divinity? And so some of the gods said, let's hide it in the earth. And Brahman said, no, we can't do that because humans will dig into the earth to such a depth that at some point they will find it there. And so then the gods said, well, let's sink into the deepest ocean. And Brahman said, no, no, not there. They will, they will learn to dive 
into the depths of the ocean and they'll find it there. And then another, God said, let's take it to the top of the highest mountain and we'll hide human's divinity there. And then they said, no, not there either, because eventually they will climb even the highest mountain and they will find their divinity. So the gods gave up. They said, we don't know where to hide it. And it seems like there's no place on earth that we can hide it, either in the earth or the sea or up in the sky, where human beings won't eventually reach it. And so Brahman thought for a long time. And then he finally said, here's what we'll do. We will hide the human's divinity deep within the center of their own being. <laughs> for humans will never think to look for it there. <laughs> And all the gods thought that was perfect. <laughs> and so the deed was done. And since that time, humans go around, up and down the earth, digging, climbing, exploring, searching for that thing that is already within them. And we do that, right? You know, what's the latest, the latest self-help book, the latest workshop, the latest telenor, webinar, seminar that we go to? To find, our, to find our inner peace, our inner being, our divinity, when it's within us all along. And here's the thing, we have free will. We have as much time as we want, right, to, to explore and to discover that the divinity rests within us. We just need to get quiet, right? As Emerson said, the, that seed of perfection that nestles within us. That's where it is. It's been there all along. So our search takes us far and wide, and in the end, or... When we get there, we find it's been within us all along. You know, when we're babies, we're born with two fears. Two fears, two fears only. The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Those are the only two newborn fears that we have. Everything else you've collected along the way. Don't you love that? Think of all the things you're afraid of now. You've collected that all along the way. But when we're infants, those are the only two. We're just the divine expressing. We are just the divine expressing. And then we spend the rest of our lives collecting all these other false ideas about, you know, that cover over the divinity that we are. We learn fear, we learn to hate, we learn to be timid, we learn to deny our wholeness, we learn from friends and we learn from family, we learn from our culture and our tribe and our community and our country. We learn all sorts of things that limit our experience of life and that limit the experience of life that we could be living. And you know, it's interesting because some of the fears that we've collected, we don't even have words to. I mean, think about it. Here, you think about this infant who is, who is a newborn, right? Only two fears, fear of falling, fear of loud noises. And then you think about that infant with screaming parents in the other room. That's loud noises. That's scary. And now, there are no words for that. That infant just knows, I'm afraid, right? That's fear of loud noises. And so this is a human that can grow up not trusting the world. The world's not a safe place, right? Because of all those loud noises. Now, there's no words for that. It's just a feeling because it is pre-verbal, right? But the infant grows up with just a, a, a low, low ability to trust. To trust life is a safe place to be. Right? The world's not a safe place because of all that noise. Now, that can be planted in a time where there's no words. So years of psychotherapy is not going to uncover that. That's pre-verbal. It's just a feeling. But here's what's so great about our faith tradition. That, too, heals. That, too, heals. Even those things that are nonverbal, even those things that are below the level of consciousness. Ernest Holmes said this. He said, it is not the spirit of man that needs to be made whole, it is his mental reaction to life that needs healing. These mental reactions are both conscious and subjective. Spiritual mind treatment, successful spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer, neutralizes negative reactions on both the conscious and the subjective levels. So we can heal things, which means what? Revealing the truth, because we're already whole. There is nothing to heal. So healing means the revealing of truth, of what's been there all along. So we are able to reveal that truth even if we don't remember it. It means we get to heal. We get to get over. We get to reveal our inner wholeness even when the memory is irretrievable. Healing is our birthright. Ernest Holmes said that. Healing is our birthright. 
That's really important in this faith philosophy. The revealing of what is already there. That inner divinity, it is always there waiting to be uncovered. And that's our job. We do the work of uncovering all those things that we added on along the way as we were growing up, right? As we're growing up, we come across all kinds of advice, don't we? Didn't your parents give you all kinds of helpful, handy hints on how to be successful in life? Weren't they all a pilot? <laughs> Stuff. There's all kinds of things we're told growing up. As we grow, we come across all kinds of advice on how to succeed in life. Keep your head down. Right? Did you forget that? Keep your head down. Or stand tall, stand up. You'll never get noticed for your brilliance if you don't stand up and stand tall. No, no, no. It's the tall nail that gets hammered down. Right? Keep your head down. No, no, no. Why try to fit in when you were born to stand out? No, no, no. Better safe than sorry. Do something every day that scares you. No, 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 don't make waves. Right? No, everything you want is on the other side of your fear. No, at the end of the day, the rules are simple, safe and security. I remember I was getting serious with a guy one time, and I told my mom, I think we're getting serious, and she said, does he have medical coverage? <laughs> <laughs> That's what's important, right? Anyway, so Ernest Holmes said this, he said, the person who can throw himself with a complete abandon into that limitless sea of receptivity having cut loose from all parent moorings is the one who will succeed and have the greatest reward. Cast off those thoughts of limitation and lack. Cast off the ideas that are limiting, that are weighing you down, those false beliefs that are saying, no, you can't, or you shouldn't, or you're too old, or you're not educated enough, or you're not tall enough, or you're not this, or you're not that. Cast those off. Throw off with complete abandon into that limitless sea of receptivity. That's what we're here to do. Thank you. We may grow up being exposed to all of those conflicting ideas. And, and we probably are, right? Be safe, big floor, you know? What, what is it, you know, uh, ships are safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are built for, you know? We grow up with all kinds of conflicting advice and thoughts, and, and, and at some point, all we have is us. All we have is us. We are responsible. Right? Once you become an adult, you're, you know, it doesn't matter what your parents said and your grandparents said or your culture said or your country said or whatever. At some point, you're responsible. Response-able, right? Response-able. Able to respond. You are able to respond to the situations you find yourself and change them. Able to respond to whatever happens to us. And we can change it. Ernest Holmes said, we come to believe that at the center of our lives, there is a wholeness. And we should think of the mind as the door through which it enters. Therefore, we should be very careful to guard what comes into our mind from the opinions of others and to regulate what comes into it from any source. So we don't just believe things because people tell you. You don't believe things because I tell you. You take it in. You have to think about it. You have to meditate on it. You have to examine it. You have to see if it works for you. We're here to transcend those limiting thoughts, even the limiting thoughts we gathered onto us since we were babies, right? I mean, how many times? Fear of loud noises, fear of falling. That's it. So who's afraid of heights, and who's afraid of enclosed spaces, and who's afraid of whatever, 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 all of those other things that you've, you've you know, added on to your life, they are false beliefs. And so we transcend those limiting thoughts. We push through our old fears. We're not here to collect fears. We're here to power through them. Yeah, right? Live the whole life of God. Live that whole big, juicy life. Not be limited by those things that people told us we should be afraid of. We've heard those things from our family all the time. You know, and even if we value those relationships, value the relationship with my father, I value the relationship with my sisters, but I don't have to value the saying. I don't have to value the, the advice. 
right? I don't have to stay true to it in order to love the person. You can still love the person and not believe what they say or, or, or not believe the advice that, you know, that they, they give you. You can disagree with someone else's view of the world and still love them. We have to stop trying, well, we have to stop going along to fit in. We really, really have to stand in our truth and speak our truth, whatever that is, in the moment. And, and Emerson, I love Emerson, he said, and even if tomorrow what you believe is the exact opposite of that, stand in the truth of that then too. And somebody will tell you, well, you're not being consistent. Yes, yesterday you said just the opposite. So what? That was yesterday. I'm not that person anymore. Now I believe this. Right? Emerson was the one that said consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds or mediocre minds or something. So you learn something new, you believe something new, and you stand in the truth of that. We are whole, perfect, and complete. I believe that. I believe Ernest Holmes when he said that. We are whole, perfect, and complete because we are plugged in to spirit because the energy, which is God, is the energy that's running my life. That energy, I know, is whole, perfect, and complete, comes, uh, comes equipped with all those ingredients. There's one life, it's spiritual life, and, and its source is the source of my life. Its energy is running my life, and everyone else is, and everything in the manifest universe, each one of us, individualized expressions of that energy that's running through everything. If we think of spirit as source energy, right? It's not a guy with a long white beard sitting on a cloud somewhere, indiscriminately smiting some people and blessing others depending on what mood it's in. It's energy, it's energy, that's it. It just exists and it creates because that's what it does and it created us and it filled us with all of that. All of the qualities that it is pours into everything it makes, it made us. So we are whole, perfect and complete, just as we are. And we don't have to be anything but authentic because there are seven and a half billion of us, we were all made, we we're all here to add our bit to the whole of life, so your part in it is irreplaceable. You have to be true to who you are because you are necessary. You, the you that you are, so don't try to be somebody else. Wasn't it Oscar Wilde, right? He said, be yourself, everybody else is taken. <laughs> be yourself, be yourself. There's one life, it's spirit's life, that's source, that energy, that runs everything. That's our picturing as each one of us and everything and every blade of grass and every tree. It's like spirit energy is electricity, right? And we plug into that. And we're all different. I've said this before. But we run on the same energy. We all run on the same energy. It's like I'm a toaster and you're a blender. You're a Cuisinart, you know? You're a, you're a, a blow dryer. <laughs> anyway. Um, a juicer or hot rollers or, you know, you're something else. A TV, a, an electric toothbrush, a can opener. We're all running on the same energy. Sorry. We're all running on the same energy, but we're all different. We're all different, but we all plug into the same source energy. We're all animated by that same energy, yet we are all distinct and different and unique from each other. We each have unique qualities. We each have unique strengths. We each draw from this universal mind which feeds us what we resonate with, what we demonstrate. That's why some draw music from that universal source and create music and sing songs and play instruments. Someone else draws artistic expression from that one source and they paint pictures or they create sculptures. Someone else draws the vocabulary from universal mind and they write beautiful books or poetry or prose. Everyone draws from that same source but then they, but then they individualize it, make it their own and then they create fabulous and wonderful things. And that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to demonstrate. The uniqueness is us. That's why we're made whole, perfect, and complete in the image and likeness. That's, that's because we are in, imbued with all of those qualities of God. And we're here to demonstrate the fullness of spirit that only we can our own little unique way. Draw upon the strength. Draw upon the strength of spirit. We can do that without without drawing upon the weakness or the false beliefs. We, we go through them to find the greater good. 
We go through our fears. We work through them. We're not here to collect fears. We are here to be presented with situations and then to overcome them and to, and to go through them, to experience them and be greater on the other side of them. Oh, I used to feel that, but now, huh, I healed that thing, right? I used to have a fear of heights, and you know, I don't even know where that one came from. I just collected it along the way. I mean, nothing traumatic ever happened to me. I didn't fall off a ladder or anything. I just, as I grew older, I got afraid of heights, and then I got more and more afraid of heights, and then at some point, I got annoyed that I was afraid of heights, and I decided to get rid of it. And I would walk across suspension bridges, and then I went up in a hot air balloon once. <laughs> that was funny. So, so the, last, the last thing I did was skydive. You want to get over a fear of heights, go skydiving. <laughs> It'll get rid of a fear of heights. I did that three times, because one didn't do it, you know? <laughs> anyway, I did it three times. It's like, okay, I got it. I got, this, I got this height thing handled now, you know? But that's what we're here to do. We're here to, to, to transcend those limiting beliefs, not to live inside of them. Living inside of them is a small life. Ernest Holmes said this. He said, there is a wellspring of life and perfection at the center of your being upon which you may draw. Every longing, every yearning you have ever had, every secret desire of your soul, every constructive ambition you've ever had is a whispering of life, assuring you that you are one with it. You are a concrete manifestation, a personification of it. You are a center where life passing through you becomes definite, distinct, unique individualization of itself. There is no one like you at all in the whole universe, and there never will be. Thank you.